Okay, I think we will just make a start. Um, so welcome everybody to this evening's webinar. Again, we're funded by the University Innovation Fund to hold our lamb crop series. So last week we looked at increasing output and largely looking at triplet management. So this week we're swinging over to the inputs and we're looking to reduce inputs. Um, we're really focusing on grass. Next week we'll focus more so on labour. And we have got two fantastic speakers um, tonight that we're going to hear from and Poppy Freighter and Mike Evans. We are going to get a huge amount of information <laughs> dumped on us in the next um, couple of hours with, with these guys and the huge amount of knowledge that they have. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with Poppy first. And um, Poppy, I don't know if you want to get your screen up just while we are um, bringing you through. So I am sure most of you will know Poppy or heard of Poppy. Poppy is one of my colleagues here at SEC and she is our sheep and grassland specialist. Um, Poppy is a leading person I would say in um, reducing reducing um, outputs, eh, reducing sorry, reducing inputs. Eh, <laughs> it's all going wrong isn't it? Reducing inputs and especially through grassland management. So she is very apt to speak to us this evening. Poppy, I'm going to hand over to you. Great. Yes, thank you, Kirsten. Absolutely. Reducing inputs and optimising outputs, I guess, is my, my aspiration for you all. Um, I'm going to give a quick whistle stop tour of some concepts that I think can help make you more from grass, make more from grass. Um, because I know um, Mike's got quite a complicated um, topic to cover, so I'll be a relatively short presentation and um, so we can have more time to hear a bit more from Mike and then hopefully have more opportunity to unpick some of these topics that are relevant that you have questions about in the Q&A session afterwards as well. Um, Grass-based farmers, I think, are being tested uh, like never before. I think the weather is becoming increasingly unpredictable and the costs of inputs are highly variable year to year. Um, so I think making more from less is becoming more of a critical strategy, I think, for sustainable success. So in tonight's talk, I'm going to give an overview of the opportunities that sheep, uh, UK sheep farmers have to make your resource go further. In this way, you can reduce reliance on inputs and gain more control of your profit margin. Hopefully my slides are moving okay. Um, and yes, I think they are. Great, thanks Kirsten. Um, and I think the primary way to make grass go further, um, it's no surprise to those of you that have heard me talk before, the primary way is rotational grazing. Um, and the primary means in which rotational grazing makes that grass go further is increased grass utilization. More of that grass grown goes down the animal's throats to make meat or milk or wool or whatever the case may be. Um, and this is sort of relationship between grass utilization and profitability is quite clear. Um, so remember, it's not we can make all the grass in the world, but if it's not utilised to produce uh, the product that you want, then it's not going to make you more money. Um, and by increasing that utilisation of grass, the profits can benefit either in reduced inputs, um, reduced variable costs, and or increased outputs. Um, so, for instance, I know of, of a farmer who calculated um, their feed and fertilizer savings to equate to £10,000 per year. So that farmer has been rotationally grazing for 13 years. Um, so 130k uh, benefit so far through implementing rotational grazing. Um, I also know of an organic farm who saw an increase in kilos of live weight produced um, by 100 kilos per hectare. So we value at the two pounds a kilo of live weight, that's 200 pounds per hectare per year. So like I say, it can either come at one or the other or both together. We're producing, we're making more of what we're producing at the end of the day. <laughs> 
The other benefit of rotational grazing is it gives us that power to improve and maintain pasture quality throughout the year. Um, and this graph illustrates that potential. Now, back in 2017, um, observing um, this project output, Forage for Knowledge, which is kind of similar um, to a uh, Grass Check GB, um, it's an AHDB pr uh, project working with 20 odd dairy farmers submitting pasture measurements and quality analysis throughout the growing season. And what it shows is uh, the top line was the, the crude protein. And you can see it's sort of stuck within the sort of um, a, just a low to mid 20s mark throughout the season. Um, the next line down is the dry matter. Um, and those two lines, they're of interest, but the, the line of most interest to me is this line here, the metabolizable energy. Um, and what was interesting to me in this year, and, and in fact, they've done it in subsequent years, um, was that they were able to keep the ME, the energy line, in this 12 to 12 and a half ME mark throughout the growing season. Um, what I would expect to see as that grass um, uh, seed goes to heads and dead material builds up, what I generally expect to see is that ME decline. Now I know um, that grazing for beef and sheep farmers is different and perhaps more complicated than it is for dairy farmers, but it's just really nice to know what is possible with grazing management, what is possible to uh, maintain the ME throughout the season. And the reason of, that energy is most of most interest to me is because energy correlates with animal performance at grass. Energy is often, most often, the limiting factor that affects animal performance. Now this graph taken from um, 400 plus at Beef and Lamb New Zealand a document shows that quite nicely. And um, with increasing diet quality, we can expect a relationship um, with lamb growth rates. Other things being equal, and I know Mike is going to talk about parasites um, later on, which of course have an impact. But as you can see, I've kind of related this, this energy density of the ration to um, the types of uh, grass that we might see in front of the animal. And as you can see, we can expect the best performance from lambs on high clover pasture or multi-species swords. And this is what the stuff we want to favor. And we can achieve this in a couple of ways, in a number of ways. Um, one is sort of grazing management to keep that grass nice and leafy. And another is, is management to encourage these legumes to persist. And I, and I think white clover is, um, is a, a good plant to encourage um, by encouraging soil, by improving soil fertility and grazing management to make sure that that clover um, gets that sunlight uh, needed for growth through the season. And the main way to, to manage this for quality is managing grazing residuals, the grass left behind um, upon grazing a field um, so that that stem and dead material isn't left to build up. Now that presents a bit of a dilemma because um, balancing the needs of the present animals and the future animals can be quite tricky. Um, to achieve those low residuals for, for future quality, could come at a price of current lamb performance if we're not careful. This graph shows how pasture height um, relates to the live weight gain of, of lambs um, from a study in 1980. And we can see that as we force animals to graze below five centimeters, we can see an impact on animal performance. So, in the short term, we want to be avoiding our high performing animals to be grazing too low. But in the longer term, we want to graze um, uh, low enough to ensure uh, that we prevent that stem and dead material building up so that into the future, 
those that land performance isn't affected by the energy density of the grass in front of them. A fantastic way of achieving this balance is leader follower grazing. Um, and in this, with using lambs, we would have them in front. Um, and then what we would have behind them so is some cleanup uh, stock. And in this case, we've got cows and calves behind doing a tidy up job for them. And this is, it works beautifully to make sure that those using lambs aren't forced to graze too low for the, for the benefit of future quality, but that future quality is still maintained by the, the stock following behind. Now, of course, that isn't possible on every farm. Um, I still think that um, management tools such as topping can help behind the grazing animals, or maybe later on into the season, we might sacrifice um, future quality for the, for the short term benefit of that the lamb growth rates. Um, if we've got um, perhaps silage aftermaths or another sort of um, opportunity, a grazing opportunity, and there to keep those lambs growing into the future. So it's very much a, a fine balancing act there. Um, and that brings me on to how to encourage quantity to keep that grass in front of those animals. So to make sure that we're not forced to graze them too low because we're running short of grass altogether. Um, and encouraging quantity, I think there's loads of ways um, we can, um, those are things we can do within our control in order to achieve this. And of course, there are some aspects out with of our control. Um, weather <laughs> um, but of course there are things that we can do to just sort of um, do what we can to to promote uh, that grass production um, and firstly I would say that rest is important to uh, keep grass growing um, one ryegrass um, can only one ryegrass tiller um, can only have three leaves growing at one time so what we intend to do post grazing is try and rest the pasture um, a length of time to make sure it gets to its, um, its production potential, the three leaf stage, and doesn't go beyond. Because when that fourth leaf starts to grow, the first leaf dies and represents a wasted feed opportunity. So often in rotational grazing, we're trying to coincide when we return to a field with when the, the tillers are around the three leaf stage. Um, so one to, to help us with this sort of planning, um, it's useful to know how long it takes for a tiller to grow one leaf. And that length of time absolutely changes throughout the season. So at peak, it can take sort of five to seven days to grow one leaf. Um, whereas in the winter, it can take over 30 days to grow one leaf. So at peak grass growth, that might be a 15 to 21 day rest is optimal. Um, whereas in the winter, we're thinking 90, 100 days rest is optimal. Um, and that sort of winter rest, if nothing else, I just wanted to kind of um, set just wanted to emphasize the, the point of winter rest because that has been uh, quite well proven. Um, back in 1970, so decades ago, um, a John Frame study showed in Southwest Scotland that set stocking sheep from October to March time had a quantifiable effect on April yields. They found that set stocking sheep, even just um, from October to December, reduced April yield, um, but reduced yield more so from January through to March time. So that winter rest um, absolutely influences spring grass growth. Um, and it's at a critical time um, where often supply and demand are quite tight on the farm. So winter rest, I would say, is absolutely um, something we should plan into these systems to, as I say, stack the odds in the favour for spring grass growth. 
And other ways um, to encourage quantity of grass, um, it's useful to, to remember the concept that grass grows grass. The leaf area there to capture sunlight will um, help ensure that the grass continues to, to capitalize on that sunlight and continues to grow. Um, and this statistic taken from, again, this, this Beef and Lamb New Zealand document, um, just kind of puts that into to figures that covers at around sort of three centimeters mark will grow at 80% of the grass potential. If there's only two centimeters of grass, we're only getting 60% of the potential grass growth. Um, and so for this reason, often uh, where they're set stocked or rotationally grazed, we're hoping to kind of keep the grass at the, so, um, try and keep managing the grass to be in this sort of six centimeters uh, zone. So bringing all that together, um, this rotational grazing uh, graphic is taken from our Forage First Sheep Systems document. Um, and it kind of sets a guide, and I use that term very specifically because um, how you apply this on farm should very much vary according to your farm and according to how the season plays out. But it gives a bit of a framework for those that want to get started rotationally grazing. And I guess the sort of key points from this is um, a target in height of eight centimeters and a target out height of five centimeters. Those two, two bits of information just help um, us understand if these, these are challenging to achieve, they help us understand whether we've got the rest and the stocking pressure right. Um, like I said, during the summer, the rest period often as a guide should be around 15 to 25 days. However, if I'm struggling to get to eight centimeters, that's an indication that the rest period's not long enough. And if I'm exceeding eight centimeters, that's an indication that this, um, the grass is growing faster than I'm coming around and there's opportunity to shorten the rotation. So I think that sort of target in is a key indicator as to whether you've got that rest right. Um, for those of you just wanting to get started, um, this sort of system creating sort of eight paddocks um, with sort of 200 to 250 ewes and lambs, uh, grazing over three days and providing that three week rest period might be a nice, nice simple start. Alternatively, even those that uh, just want to, to understand the principle on their farms, I would suggest just splitting the field in half and moving stock between two halves is a good starting point or grouping stock together and moving them around fields and um, anything you can within your means just to increase that stocking pressure um, and then enabling that ability to give the grass a rest. And like I say, um, we'll put a link to this in the chat and I'm quite happy to send out copies of this this guide with a bit more information and um, for those that would like to um, learn a little bit more about rotational grazing and um, other aspects to make more from pasture. Now going further and um, there are other sort of concepts that we can work with um, just to go that step further um, and again help us produce more grass, particularly uh, um, in the spring. Um, this concept of, of the lawnmower effect it was first introduced to me by Andre von Barneveld, and I thought it worked. Um, it kind of uh, helped um, instill this point in me. If you think about your, your lawns, um, and how soon in the season you start mowing your lawn, you may have observed that um, mowing the lawn early on in the year means you have to mow it more frequently. And that's not uh, just by, by chance. By mowing the lawn, you're, you're, mowing, you're getting rid of the, um, the winter dormant material, and that actually encourages more grass growth. Um, and so for this reason, um, someone noticing a benefit 
of grazing the grass um, quite quickly in March, um, early on in the year, because by grazing off that winter dormant material, they're seeing a benefit come April time in pasture growth. Um, and some, so some people are doing what's called a pre-lambing rotation, where they um, move the, the pregnant ewes in late pregnancy round the, the paddocks or the, the area destined for, for the flock come lambing time quite quickly um, to benefit that grass production at the all important lambing time. And it works fantastically because in late pregnancy, um, grass is uh, the best feed that they can have. Um, so giving uh, ewes and twins um, grass a graze grass, fresh grass on a regular basis and um, works really well. Um, and then in addition, you're getting this benefit later on. However, I would say that conducting a pre lambing rotation should be a year by year decision. Um, and I notice across the country um, that soil conditions might be a bit wet for this, this year. So it might not be one to, to consider this year um, for fear of damaging the soil. And then the other question to ask whether to do this is, is there enough grass? And I would say my sort of general guide is seven centimetres average um, to make that worth your while. But it might be one to consider for future years. And then finally, I just wanted to come on to multi-species swords as these hold a lot of benefit um, as you saw in my previous graph um, to keep that quality in front of the animals um, and also they hold, hold a host of other benefits for biodiversity and reducing dependency on nitrogen fertilizer. Um, another excellent resource is this uh, um, farm advisory service uh, guide multi-species swords with a bit of information there. Um, and when it comes to multi-species swords, I see a lot of benefit for with um, red clover, um, uh, chicory pl and plantain. I think these sort of three species really do um, bring a lot to the mix. Now there's a lot of research being done on these swords um, over in New Zealand uh, by Massa University. Um, and to the extent where they were actually produced a specific sword stick um, for management of these swords. And what you can see on this sword stick is that the guide for letting stock in was 15 centimetres and the guide for bringing stock out is seven centimetres. Um, and I think that just alludes to the fact that these herbs require subtly different management to just grazing a ryegrass clover sword. These herbs prefer um, being left a bit longer, so often sort of five days, perhaps longer than what I recommend for a standard uh, ryegrass and clover sward to enable them to get to quite taller, taller heights and avoid grazing them too low. Now, the slight differences with um, these New Zealand systems compared to our systems is they tend to be pure herb uh, mixes and tend to have minimal grass content. Um, so those of you that have more grass in the mix might start to manage it um, more akin to what I recommend for a grass and clover sward. Um, so maybe um, it's a bit of a sort of spectrum um, between these height recommendations and those that I've recommended as standard guidelines. But the value of, of these mixed species um, can be seen in the, the response to nitrogen fertilizer of a range of different mixes um, that's been observed in this research um, done by um, Grace and colleagues over in Ireland. And what they did for this study was they showed um, for a range of different mixes. So just to unpick this, the first start point of this ratio is the grass in the mix. The middle one, the legumes, and the end one is the herbs. So you can see the top one is 100% ryegrass. Uh, this one is a 40% ryegrass, 60% legume, and zero herbs, and so on. 
For all these different mixes, you can see the response to increasing nitrogen. These three here that are responding quite uh, positively to nitrogen are the three with no legumes in the mix. As we increase the legumes in the mix, that line becomes flatter and flatter. To the extent this one at the top, 40% uh, ryegrass, 60% legumes, is at 15 tonnes and very slim response to increasing fertiliser. The other thing to note on this graph is this line here is perennial ryegrass with 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. So no legumes, perennial ryegrass and 250 kilos of nitrogen. So you can see this one with 40% uh, ryegrass, 60% legumes, the yield of this is far exceeding the perennial ryegrass alone um, with 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. These legumes absolutely help reduce dependency on nitrogen fertilizer. And that's fantastic because in addition to that, um, the team, the Smartgrass team of University College Dublin, and I give special thanks to Professor Tommy Boland for this slide. Um, what the team have seen is that with um, greater species in the mix, there is an observed and a quantified benefit in lamb weaning weights. So we've got perennial ryegrass here, perennial ryegrass and white clover, a six species mix and a nine species mix. And the six species mix um, had a 2.4 greater live weight weaning than the perennial ryegrass sward. They absolutely improve the quality of the ration in front of the lambs, um, and therefore that is uh, seen in, in terms of lamb weaning weights. And finally, I just wanted to allude to the value of taking stock of your, your pastures to help understand the need for inputs such as fertilizer and feeds. Those of you that um, invested in a plate meter, perhaps as, as part of the capital grant scheme, might be sort of lost as to how to use that information from the plate meter. And I think a good entry point into that is just taking what I call a stock take at key times of the year. So maybe in the spring and in the autumn, um, because this just is, gives a bit of information alongside other bits of information, such as your scanning figures and um, your U condition, it just gives a bit of information to, um, to help build the picture as to why, um, why the, the year might have panned out the way it did. Um, and I just think that record information just builds with time um, to improve, um, improve that management, uh, those management decisions. Um, these graphs are taken from a piece of software called Farmax, um, and the green line shows the farm average cover, and the green line shows the minimum cover that you can get away with. Um, and Farmax is just one sort of feed budgeting tool to help understand um, and forecast into the future when um, inputs might be required, when these lines are getting too close together, when um, pasture is going to be um, a pasture supply is going to be a problem. Um, and then this one is taken from um, a, a, a farmer I know well, uh, Giles Henry, Giles and Stuart Henry at Oakwood Mill. Um, and you can see these blue dots are their pasture cover measurements throughout this 2023. This is their most recent one in January. And now this farmer can forecast out into 2024 to see if there are any issues on the horizon or any opportunities, as the case may be, and it looks to be on the horizon for Oakwood Mill. So the more information in terms of um, pasture that we have, the more ability that we have to understand um, problems on the horizon or uh, opportunities, as the case may be. So that's my whistle stop tour, and I'm really happy to unpick some of these concepts further uh, in the Q&A, but here are my six top tips. I think rotational grazing can reduce cost and or increase output. I think quality and height is really important to achieve that land performance. 
managing grass risks and heights do encourage grass growth. Um, some of you might consider pre and rotation if you have enough of grass and the soils allow. Absolutely a, a place for multi-species for land performance. And taking stock of your pasture, it just gives a bit more information to help us meet, be more strategic. Um, I think the weather does make everything so challenging, um, but management can go a long way to, as I say, stack the odds in your favour. And I just want to give thanks to um, the researchers like Tommy Boland, um, but also to a lot of farmers that I'm very uh, fortunate to work with, um, as they've really sort of stretched my thinking in this regard. Um, so in particular, there's Graham Lofthouse, Charlie and Andrea Walker, Giles Henry, Duncan Nellis, Jamie Leslie and Jim Logan. These farmers have um, really helped um, stretch my thinking in this regard. So thank you to you and thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Poppy. Um, a really, really good rundown there of um, grass, a whistle stop really, wasn't it? Um, we have got some questions coming in. I am just going to fire one at you just now. And it was put on just when you had up the slide about legumes and adding legumes into your grass mixes. And um, the question is, what legumes would you add into a grass mix? Yeah, I think first and foremost, white clover. Um, white clover and ryegrass just go together so well. Um, and I think if you can manage that well, then you might start thinking about other legumes. Red clover, I think it's fantastic for lamb growth rates. Um, that seems to be the, the rocket fuel for lamb, lambs. And it's also really nice um, in dry weather because uh, it's got a long, long deep tap root um, and tends to be quite drought tolerant. Um, and then other species like bird's foot trefoil as well have been seen and there's been quantified benefits to lamb growth rates for these. Um, there are other sort of, I would say, more specialist legumes like uh, lucerne and sanfoin, but these require quite high pH levels and very well-drained soils. Um, so I think they have some potential application, but it's perhaps more limited in Scotland. And there's, there's quite a few different types of like red and white clover as well, isn't there? You put like your crimson clovers and oh, yeah. I think just everybody's situation, it's it's worth having a, a look to see what's on the market, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that conversation with your merchant as well, because um, I've seen people invest in herbs and legumes that just won't thrive in their context. And um, so it's absolutely worth considering your soil pH and how well drained these thing, uh, the soils are um, before you invest in the seed, because often they, they just won't last. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Poppy. There is more questions still coming in, but we will wait until we've heard from Mike, if that's OK. So um, if you can maybe stop sharing your screen and we can let Mike bring up his screen. I think Mike following on from Poppy is absolutely brilliant because Poppy has set the scene here of um, how, how to reduce inputs through managing grassland and um, especially with rotational grazing and with rotational grazing comes more animals on a small piece of land. They're, they're after a year like we've had for um, worms and sheep makes you start to, to ask questions. So I think having Mike here this evening in our living rooms is fantastic. Um, Mike is a guru on, <laughs> on sheep worms. Um, he has done a PhD on the variation in roundworm species and the impact on sheep. And in 2023, he was qualified as a European specialist in small ruminant health and management. So he is a fantastic person to have along tonight. Mike, can I hand over to you? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that, Kirsten. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, really pleased to, to be able to talk to you today about something which I find so so interesting and is obviously so important. Um, as uh, both Kirsten and Poppy mentioned, there's uh, quite a lot of material to get get through tonight. Uh, so I'll I'll try to move through it quickly. Hopefully everyone will, will come on the journey with me and I won't leave, leave you behind. Um, but if we do run out of time, always you know, really pleased to get uh, questions either in the session or, or or afterwards by email. Uh, 
double check that that's moved on to the second slide there. It certainly has, yep. Great, thank you. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to talk to you very briefly about worm biology, um, just because I think it really helps just to understand, if we can understand the life cycles and a bit about the, these worms' ecology and how they respond to the environment, it really makes a lot of what we're going to talk about subsequently make a lot more sense. So we'll talk about that first, then we'll move on to climate change. So think about changes that are occurring with climate change, both in, in time, so with seasons, and also in space, so across different parts of the country. But hopefully, you know, we'll talk about where we are already and what's predicted for the future. Then uh, following on from, from Poppy's great talk, uh, talk a bit more about grazing management, um, both rotational and, and multi-species, and how this influences potentially you know, exposure and factors such as immunity. And then finally, thinking you know, more about uh, anthelmintic treatments, because obviously these are still necessary in a lot of contexts, um, and how we can be targeted and, and selective with those treatments and make them as much sustainable as possible. So worm biology, every, every talk on worm biology has to start with a picture of the life cycle, which is just on the, the left-hand side of the screen here. Um, and I'm sure most people would be very familiar with the, the kind of top half of this uh, picture of the life cycle. So essentially there are worms on the pasture, on the grass, uh, which you can see in the top right image on the screen, that are contained in little droplets of water. Um, these, those, those ones in the photograph there, they're just about the size, just smaller than an eyelash. Uh, and then, you know, there can be hundreds in a, in a drop, but just like that. When these are consumed by the sheep, they obviously infect them in either the stomach or the, or the intestines. They develop into adults and, and lay eggs, which contaminate the pasture. But when we're thinking about what's going on uh, in terms of environmental impacts on, on parasites, what happens next is probably you know, more important, actually. Um, so they go through a couple of larval development stages. Essentially, they're just growing. Uh, and for those first two stages, they're living inside the fecal pat, so in the dung, and they're consuming the contents from the dung and using that to drive energy and grow. Uh, but then when they get to the final stage, which you can see in the, the microscope picture on the, in the middle right, um, they get trapped inside the skin from the previous life stage. So this is quite a hard kind of exoskeleton called a cuticle, and it gives them a lot of protection against environmental and variables, but unfortunately, well, unfortunately for the worm, it blocks their mouth parts, so they can't eat anymore. So from that point, there's a ticking clock in terms of the resources available to that worm, and that uh, feeds into um, to how long they can survive in the environment. And then at the bottom, um, I've just got uh, some pictures of Nemphotirus, uh, Nemphotirus eggs, that is, uh, just because it's a slight exception to the rule in that rather than developing um, on the pasture, these have a really hard shell, really resistant shell, uh, and the worm develops inside the shell until it hatches, usually or traditionally after a, after a cold spell, followed by a warm spell. So within this kind of life cycle, there's lots of different conditions that the worms like and they, and they dislike. Um, so starting on the left here, surface water, this is re required for movement on the pasture. Um, so heavy raindrops in, in cattle feces, cattle parasites, have been shown that they can uh, increase the distance that they travel just by simply splashing the worm further, but they are able to swim somewhat. This is a picture of uh, a worm on a glass slide, or a video rather I've taken from YouTube, um, and you can see that it's, it's quite able to, uh, to wriggle uh, along, but that's only on a flat surface. So it's able to travel within a film of water, but on a dry surface they can't move, and in really deep water, or uh, they, they simply sink. Um, so they need, you know, they require this uh, film of, of surface water to move. I should just just remind me, I didn't say at the start. Uh, very few of these images are my own, uh, but just in the interest of keeping everything tidy on the screen, I've left all the, the credits to the to the end. The other thing that the the worms need uh, to develop is, is humidity, and this is really important for development and survival. Uh, so rainfall is also going to you know, play a role in that, but actually it's the microclimate that's most important. Um, so that's the, you know, the, ex the environment that those worms are experiencing either within the fecal pack where they can take shelter or down in the pasture matting at the base of the sward. This, uh, these microclimates also provide some shelter from UV light, which they really dislike and is quite, quite dangerous to them and fatal to them. Um, and then also temperature plays a big role. So I put a picture uh, of the candle burning at both ends just on, on the bottom there. 
So I said at the start, um, these worms have a limited supply of energy once they're in their third life stage. Um, and the, their metabolism is essentially, you know, it's a chemical reaction. And the higher the temperature it is, the quicker that reaction occurs. And they're not able to regulate that themselves because they're essentially cold blooded. Um, so although um, at higher temperatures, they develop more quickly, they also die more quickly because they burn through their food stores. So that's going to come on to, um, you know, it's going to be important when we talk about rotations and things like that. And these conditions uh, are variable for the different species of worms, which you see in the, the bottom right picture. And at very cold temperatures, uh, it will decrease their survival as well. And again, this is this is quite variable. So things like T. circumcincta, which is a, you know, a, a very nasty worm that you see quite commonly around here, um, you know, has been shown to survive under snow on, on pasture in Canada uh, over the winter. And in the lab at, at Morden Mill, we can, we can keep them in the fridge for a couple of years, in fact. So what, what are we seeing with climate change? What are we anticipating? I'm sure after you know, recent weather events that we've, that we've had and, and some of we've been through, uh, this is you know, things, these are events that we're already starting to appreciate are happening now. But in general, we're expecting and uh, experiencing hotter summers, summer droughts interspersed with very heavy rain, and milder wetter winters. And you can just see these uh, in predictions from the, the Met Office of the European uh, equivalent on, on the right here. So how is this going to affect uh, the worms in, um, you know, as a result of these climate changes? So in terms of where, where you can find the different species of worms, uh, you're going to find a northward shift in the different types of species. So in the top right there, you can see there are, there are different types of worms, different uh, species of worms that can infect sheep. Um, T. circumcincta, you know, we're quite familiar with. I'm sure a lot of people now are, are, are really have Hermonchus contortus on the bottom there on their radar, something that we used to associate uh, almost with, with tropical conditions and certainly you know, more so the south of England. But unfortunately, this has spread northwards uh, with hotter summers and uh, the milder winters as well, which uh, they're perhaps better able to survive. And you can see uh, in the bottom right here, this is a prediction um, from 2016 of the, the changes that we're going to see in Hermonchus. Uh, essentially, most of Northern Europe and you know, Scandinavia in particular, uh, but also you know, Ireland and um, Northern England, Wales and, and Scotland as well, um, really starting to see more and more Hemonchus, unfortunately. It's a really nasty parasite. But then alongside these changes in, in space, we're, we're also expecting an, an experience of some changes in time. So as I said, we've got those hotter summers, uh, which will mean that the worms are able to develop more quickly. But they're likely then to potentially persist for less time on the pasture because they're burning through the resources. And we've got those summer droughts interspersed with heavy rain, which probably means that during the drought periods, worms will be taking shelter in the pasture matter in the fecal pats. And then suddenly, when you get a big bout of heavy rain, they're suddenly able to be released out onto the pasture, creating a bit of kind of unpredictability and potentially sudden high challenges from which for our sheep. And then with these milder, wetter winters, potentially we'll have more larvae surviving on the pasture over winter. And there'll be a longer period of the season in which they can develop, which could lead for, to further signs into the winter or potentially earlier starts in the spring. Um, and I've tried to draw this on this, this graph here. So this graph here is taken from the, from the Morden Foundation. And it just shows the classic picture for when we tend to see these different species of worms throughout the year. So Teledorsagia, the brown stomach worm, tends to be seen in the summer, but because we're potentially going to see, have some earlier development and more survival over the winter, that season's potentially going to shift forward in the year. However, with persistent exposure, lambs will develop some immunity, which is why uh, that graph then starts to curve back down again into the autumn. So that might just be a shift earlier in the year. The same thing for the, for the species that we tend to see later in the year, such as Trichostrongulus. However, for Hemonchus, uh, because the patterns of development of immunity are a bit more uh, unpredictable and um, potentially we could see that happening earlier in the year, later in the year, or, or just being just greater in number in total. And then finally, we've got Nematodirus, the, the one that I mentioned at the start, which uh, usually survives the winter uh, in its really hard eggshell, and then hatches uh, come springtime, and there's obviously a, a major challenge for, for young lambs that are grazing, if they happen to be grazing at the same time as that mass hatch. <coughs> 
However, uh, these are potentially uh, evolving uh, as those winters are less reliable. So the triggers and the cues that they experience are, are, are variable. And we're starting to, uh, there are certainly some reports um, of um, peaks in homunculus in the autumn time as well. However, it's, it's a really complex system. And then I don't, although, you know, there's a huge amount of research that's gone, you know, informing this, these kind of uh, predictions, you can't just draw arrows on the graph and expect it to, to apply to, to every farm. Um, as I said, you, if you're exposed earlier, potentially you're going to develop immunity earlier. If there's more grass around earlier in the year, perhaps people are changing you know, the farm management decisions, also potential changes in nutrition patterns uh, with climate change as well. So it's very difficult to, to accurately predict um, you know, what's, uh, what we're going to see um, in the future. However, we're quite lucky in that there are some studies that have been looking at uh, parasites for a very long time in situations without any uh, human intervention. So we see in, in the wild sheep that live on uh, the archipelago St Kilda that generally with climate change over the last you know, you know, 40 years even, um, there has been an increased uh, an increase in, in egg counts uh, that, the, that the lambs are putting out in, in the summertime. Actually, you know, a really interesting study in, in rabbits, which is you know, not something that I, a species I deal with professionally, but uh, it's a really interesting study system because these, these rabbits have two types of parasites. One, which is quite similar uh, to homunculus, the blood feeding worm in sheep, um, which uh, is quite difficult uh, or unreliable for developing immunity to in rabbits as well. And then uh, another worm, which is a bit more uh, similar to one of the gut worms in sheep where they, they uh, do develop resistance. And what they found in that study is that uh, as predicted by these kind of climate models, we do see an influence um, and an increase in the free living parasite stages on the pasture um, in, these, in the areas where these rabbits are found. Um, however, uh, as, we, as, we, as I suggested earlier, um, the rabbits develop, because they're exposed earlier, they develop immunity earlier to the one that's found in the, uh, the gut worm. However, uh, for the parasite where they struggle to develop immunity, which is a bit more similar to, to Haemonchus, um, they aren't able to, to control that. So you see higher levels uh, affecting the rabbits, and that's happening uh, throughout that entire extended period, both earlier in the year and later in the year. However, we're quite lucky. Uh, in sheep, and that there's been a huge amount of, of work going to develop the only the only available vaccine against a, against a parasitic nematode called Barbavax, which means that we can artificially induce some resistance against Haemonchus. So we do have some some tools in a, in our arsenal to, to try and combat this. So as a summary for the, the climate change section of the talk, I'd say generally uh, it's quite hard to predict, but we're expecting that we will see probably some season advancement really strong predictions that we're going to see more common to Tamonkas, unfortunately, and just greater unpredictability, which I think just means that we need to be more uh, proactive in our monitoring for these problems. Um, I've seen just in the questions, um, can all these, someone's asked, can all these worms be detected in fecal egg count testing? Um, yes, they yes they can, uh, as part of your normal monitoring. The nematodirus eggs look quite different, so often on a lab report you'll get those automatically. All of the other species the eggs look quite similar. So when you get a fecal egg count report back, it's a it's a it's a aggregate count that contains all these different species. So it's you know it's very useful, um, but there are you know changes in the in the pipeline for, for actually breaking that egg, egg count down into the different species that we that we see. So moving on to, to grazing management and how these impact with uh, roundworms. So there's four things I'm hopefully going to try and cover. Uh, so thinking about the breast times and how that affects uh, their survival and development, and how that feeds in with those. The sward structure, the actual nutrition and content, including bioactives within the sward, and then the dung distribution and, and the pasture, what I would call the biome more broadly. So when it comes to grazing and rest times, if you think back to those uh, larvae on the pasture that develop uh, and then have a limited uh, food supply before they die. What we're hoping for in an ideal scenario is to move our lambs off before the larvae develop and then not move them back onto the pasture until those larvae have died. And 
in some parts of the world this is this is really achievable uh, in Brazil for example you know the studies that within three weeks of moving lambs off you know a piece of pasture uh, they will, will essentially be clean grazing again so by the time you move back on it's just clean grazing so that's really uh, you know great for them uh, unfortunately it's a little more um, tricky uh, in a in a temperate context so study in, studies in Australia and kind of Gotland areas of, of New South Wales suggest that for, for really clean pasture, uh, you'd have to be leaving um, it ungrazed for, for 100 plus days. And in the Netherlands, which is maybe a little more similar to, uh, to our climate, um, you're actually not seeing that peak in infectivity, so that peak in development until three to nine weeks uh, after uh, they've been laid on in, in the dung. And it's taking till about 12 weeks before you're starting to see any declines. So essentially, uh, clean grazing, you know, strictly clean grazing through short rotations alone is unlikely uh, in UK conditions, unfortunately. Then thinking about the sward structure, um, the, input, the height of the grazing, um, so the height of the plants, um, and how far up, essentially, I'll start again. The worms have to climb from the bottom of the plant up to the top in order to get eaten. And different plants are variably difficult to climb, essentially. Um, and it's quite variable with, between the different types of plants. So, for example, for something like sedge, uh, which is you know, a very tall plant, the worms actually really struggle to climb that. And they're often restricted to the bottom 5%, 5 centimetres of, of the plant. However, on the opposite end of the scale, things like ryegrass and clover, um, they can actually you know, accumulate towards the top of the plant. And when you correct for, for dry matter, uh, you know, up to a kind of 12 and a half centimetre grazing uh, height. There's actually no difference in, in the number of larvae compared at the top compared to the bottom. However, for some of these other, other swords uh, that Poppy mentioned, so, so chicory, for example, um, they definitely do have lower densities uh, above the 75 millimetre mark. So thinking back to that sword stick that she showed us, uh, leaving that chicory at um, at 85 mil or something like that potentially might reduce how many worms uh, our stock are getting exposed to. So it is quite variable um, and it's quite a limited field of field of research. Um, I've previously been, been guilty of thinking about this in a, in a very wide glass clover uh, context and, and saying it probably doesn't make a huge amount of difference but when you're starting to get varied uh, swords then, then I think it potentially can do uh, and there's very little research on, on deferred grazing with very long sward uh, heights um, or other uh, more unusual plant species. The other question that you know I, I often ask, which but there's relatively little uh, information out there on, is given you know they, they require a, a film of moisture to travel in and they're killed by the UV light. Do more variable swords have have different or more, more variation in the microclimate? I put a picture of my my welly boots in a in a in a quite uh, simple sward. Uh, it's you know it's a brilliant sward. It's a huge amount of nutrition there. Um, however, you can see all those blades of grass are the, they're the same shape. They overlap, you know, interlock perfectly almost with each other. So potentially, you know, there's less variation um, in that microclimate. But there's, there's very little research on that yet. The other thing is that um, if you have different types of plants and the, the worms climb to different heights on the different types of plants. Uh, if you're grazing at a constant height, um, then you, to some extent you're hedging your bets because for some worms they're going to be up here, some worms are down here. If you're grazing here, hopefully you're only going to be getting potentially half of them. So potentially having a varied sward might hedge our bets a wee bit. Then uh, moving on to nutrition and the bioactives. Uh, obviously, you know these are these plants are, are more than just you know, scaffolding for, for worms to climb. Um, and as uh, you know, Poppy, you know, very excellently uh, explained, uh, how, you know, having rotational grazing and a varied sward um, can really improve your nutrition, whether that's the energy density or potentially also the protein nutrition as well. Uh, in addition, if you you know if you have a greater root depth, potentially you're able to extract more in terms of trace elements from deeper levels in the soil. Um, and all of these factors will hopefully improve your animal's immunity and potentially reduce um, the, uh, well, improve how able they are to cope with parasitic challenges as well. 
also indirect effects as well here in that if you're hitting those growth targets that, that Poppy's mentioned, you're getting your animals off the farm quicker. And that means there's fewer times for the parasites to go through their life cycle and multiply. Um, so that you know, potentially has a, has a great effect as well. And there's lots of uh, evidence out there that um, animals grazing these swords potentially do uh, fare better against parasites. A lot of interest in something called condensed tannins, um, which are toxic to, to, to parasitic worms. And they're really quite uh, efficacious when, when performed in lab studies. But at the moment, there's not a, you know, a strong body of evidence that they have uh, an effect on their own above and beyond uh, those changes in nutrition that I've just mentioned uh, in a field context. But there's a lot of continued research uh, going, going on there. So key takeaway there, I would say, is that at the end of the day, improved nutrition is really likely to reduce your roundworm problems. And then uh, thinking a bit more about the, the pasture as a, as a biome, uh, I said before, you know, they're, you know, they're not just scaffolds for, for nematodes to climb. Um, it's also not just uh, food, for, food for sheep to eat. Uh, there, it's, a, you know, it's a six inch high jungle, you know, it's got its own ecosystem. Um, and how does, how, does what we, how, do, how do our farm management practices influence that, I think is a really uh, interesting question. So there's um, evidence from, from cattle that breaking up the, the, the cow pat uh, increases how quickly larvae spread, um, but it decreases their ability to shelter from drying out. And this has been shown quite, you know, quite definitively for dung beetles. And potentially, if you've got a, a mob grazing system where you have a very focally high stocking density, there's a lot more trampling going on. Obviously, that's uh, introducing your, your feces into the soil and helping with your um, uh, soil fertility as well, um, but it is also potentially having impacts on the on those nematodes as well. Less evidence for, for sheep there, obviously they've got less uh, uh, consolidated dung. Dung beetles on the pasture also have a have a major impact, and um, it's slightly complex in that they uh, introduce air into the dung, which can uh, improve uh, larval development and survival, but uh, they then do a lot of burying. Uh, and they bury them deeper than a lot of the worms can recover from. So on balance, they're, they're probably a, a net good. And earthworms have a, have a similar role to play as well. And then in, in the bottom right here, I've got an image, uh, again from YouTube, um, of uh, two uh, soil nematodes, one uh, much larger and predatory eating the other. So these nematodes, they're living out on the pasture, but they're, you know, they have their own predators out there. There are, there are nematodes, there are mites, there are centipedes. Um, that you have a, you know, are potentially going to be impacting these as well. And unfortunately, all of these uh, you know, different uh, invertebrates um, are vulnerable to anthelmintics, so there's some potentials for, for off target effects uh, there as well. So it's very obviously complex, but in general, I would, I would say that my gut feeling on this is that you know, diverse, complex systems are often you know, very resilient, and what we don't want is massive swings in variation, um, you know, suddenly getting one species of, of parasite at large numbers on a pasture, having you know, lambs that have never seen it before. So having a, a resilient system is, is probably a good thing. So the takeaway from that, grazing management, maximizing your nutrition is you know, really important in its own right, um, but it's also very likely to help with parasite control as well. The sward height that they're grazing, uh, potentially probably does have a, an impact on how many worms they're exposed to, but it's very variable with the sward composition. That pasture biodiversity might help as, on as well. Um, and really importantly, because I think sometimes this message gets confused between different countries, uh, that we can't specifically rely on rotations alone to clean grazing. Um, so we do need to continue uh, with that monitoring of fecal egg counts and, and performance as well. So finally, moving on to treatments, um, which you know, in most contexts are, are going to be necessary at some points, um, even if you're doing everything right. However, uh, try to do things you know, as little as possible and as, as much as necessary, which is a, you know, a phrase that's used often for, for antibiotics, but I think applies to, to antibiotics as well. So our, tar so our treatments, when we talk about targeted and selective, they can either be targeted or selective or, or ideally both. So when we talk about a target, uh, we're thinking about a threshold, and when that's crossed, we instigate treatment. By having a, 
a realistic target. We're hopefully avoiding unnecessary treatment, but you don't want to set that target too high um, because you want to instigate the treatment before too much of damage is done, both to the sheep and to the pasture in terms of how many eggs have been laid on it. And then selective treatment is thinking about only treating a proportion of the group. I'm, I'm quite tight and I, you know, intrinsically, you know, hate waste and I know anthropomedics are cheap, um, but the thought of going through a, a group of lambs and, and dosing half of, you know, dosing them all and only a third of them actually needed, needed that, uh, I just hate the thought of that waste. Um, but, you know, it also you know, has a massive impact on selection for anthropomedic resistance. So by only treating some of them, we're preserving some uh, uh, animals uh, or some worms that don't get exposed to the treatment um, and reduce that uh, kind of evolutionary pressure for resistance to develop and spread. And then finally, I think uh, it's also important um, from a perspective of trying to reduce environmental pollution in uh, foreign anthropomedics. Something that people who've been working you know, in organic farms have been you know, talking about very loudly for, for a long time and um, I think I and, and many others have potentially been behind the curve on. Um, but there's, um, you know, there's a study here I've, I've just shown from uh, 2000, well, from 2021, uh, from the Republic of Ireland, um, where they took soil uh, water samples, both from surface water and from groundwater, and they were finding that uh, trace that there were you know, contamination with anthelmintics in 28% of surface water samples, and you know, arguably more concerning, 8% of of the aquifers had had contamination. And given how broad spectrum these drugs are and the impacts they have on, on essentially all invertebrates, I think that is something that we do need to really think about and incorporate into our decision making. So how can we actually you know, apply these targeted and selective treatments in practice? Um, so we can try to target and select based on clinical signs. And unfortunately, if you're trying to do that by the, by the time you're seeing hollow, sad, hunched, scouring lambs with bottle joy, it's too late. However, there are some, you know, some signs that are a bit more subtle. So this thing called Formatcha, which is shown just on the, on the bottom left here, um, is essentially a colour chart for looking at the colour of the mucous membrane in the eye in sheep. And if you have a problem with Hemonchus, which feeds on the blood, you can pick up problems relatively quickly uh, by using the colour there. So that's one way that we can just target based on clinical signs alone. I put lamb number there as well, if we're thinking about trying to reduce um, how often we're treating um, ewes in late pregnancy as well. Fecal worm egg counts are also you know, really important. Um, they're brilliant for, for getting a, an indication of um, the degree of um, uh, parasites within a group, and they're even better actually for, for predicting what's going out onto the pasture and the contamination. Um, so on the, on the right here, I've got a picture from a, from a paper you know, relatively recently, where this is for cattle parasites, where they're now able to uh, combine some of the models that we were talking about on a, on a, on a continental scale um, on a specific farm. So use the uh, environmental conditions and the number of eggs that are going onto fields to make risk maps um, for you know, how, um, how many infectious larvae we'd expect to find uh, on those particular paddocks. And then a um, colleague at the Morden, um, uh, Ailey, PhD student, has made a brilliant app uh, which you can access through this QR code, which just helps with interpreting fecal egg counts. Um, and um, because sometimes you know that communication can, can, can get lost when you get a, a report back from a lab. So I'd highly recommend you check those out. Um, however, having said they're brilliant for monitoring groups and pasture contamination, they're not very good for individuals. Um, in that it's very difficult to make a decision about which animals to treat within a group um, based on fecal egg counts because it takes a little while to get the data back um, and you, it, realistically you're never going to be able to uh, get fecal egg counts for individual sheep and then make decisions on an individual basis. However, they, you know, they are a really important part of routine monitoring. So what else can you look at? Uh, you can look at current live weight or body condition score, but essentially that's 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 history. It's, you know, that's what's gone on in the past and gives you a very poor indication um, about um, what's going on currently. Um, so it isn't great for, for targeted or selected treatments. But what is much better is change in live weight or body condition score. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think anyone, well, very few people are um, 
capable and uh, sensitive enough to detect really subtle changes in, in body condition score uh, enough to make targeted selective treatments on. Um, but live weight um, is, is a brilliant tool and some of the, you know, the equipment necessary for doing that um, are becoming far, you know, much more common uh, on, on, on farms, farms across the country. Uh, so this is uh, taken from, from one of the SRUC's uh, farms here. So this is a, an auto shedder, a uh, four-way auto shedder, uh, which is linked up to a computer and, um, and a weigh crate. And essentially, um, from this, you can input um, things like your, your plate meter readings and, and get a, and the, the environmental conditions, get an idea of how much your lambs should be growing. And then as they go through, based on their, their previous weight, see whether or not they've hit those targets, and then get shed out into different pens accordingly. Uh, important to say for these, these techniques, you obviously need to check for other reasons why they might, might not be hitting their targets. You know, uh, you know anthromedics aren't gonna cure lameness, um, but you know, they are uh, probably the most likely reason uh, for poor weight gains if you've got good nutrition and no other uh, obvious problems. So it's probably a great starting point. Um, and of course, you can be collecting samples at the same time for for monitoring and confirmation and for uh, for drench checking as well. However, I do appreciate that these facilities aren't still you know the norm on on all farms. Uh, but there's a lot of practical compromises, uh, you know, pragmatic compromises that can be made uh, to make this this more accessible. So, for instance, this graph on the on the top right uh, is from a paper where they showed that. Um, just by selecting a very a relatively small proportion of the flock, um, you know, twenty-five percent of the flock is, is absolutely plenty. You can get a very good estimate um, for a group weight gain. And although you can't then select which animals to treat, it does give you a, a, a more better indication of when when to treat a group. Um, and then on top of that, um, you can just yeah, be using things like um, set uh set targets so say for example 200 grams a day so you don't need the um necessarily quite as much computer input um in order to to, to shed these animals so um a summary there um is that um they can be targeted selective or both and hopefully by doing this we'll reduce our medicine costs we'll reduce our selection for resistance and also pollution uh, whilst maintaining the same levels of welfare and performance. A lot of practical compromises available um, and they go hand in hand with proactive monitoring uh, and the SCOPS principles as well. So in summary, you know, um, I hope I've not uh, given painted too bleak a picture. There are a lot of challenges out there, in particular humongous, you know, anthelmintic resistance and, and seasonal unpredictability. But there's a huge amount of, of work that's gone in from, from farmers, from researchers from across the industry um, that have developed some really brilliant tools for, for monitoring, for, for making predictions, uh, for grazing management and, and for treatments as well. Uh, so as I said, there's some, some key references uh, from the scientific side and also some all the images that I used uh, that I've stolen from the internet, essentially. Um, and thank you. Uh, really appreciated talking to you today and looking forward to, to some of the questions. That was brilliant, Mike. Um, a huge amount of information in a very, very small amount of time. So well done, very succinct, well done for that. Um, there has been quite a few questions. I might just come to Poppy first though and just let you get a drink or clear your throat, Mike. Um, and Poppy, there's one there's one come in for you um, and it's really picking up on where you finished off there talking about your um, setting up your pre-lambing rotation. And we've had a very, very wet winter, haven't we? And um, as people are going to build more resilient flocks um, and look to reduce these inputs, for you, your your sole opinion, um, what grazing system would you pick for pre and post lambing following a wet winter? Following a wet winter. Okay. Yeah, I think the wet weather does pose a challenge for grazing. Um, absolutely. And I think ideal world is you would think of a way of taking them off grass to avoid any risk of poaching, but that can be expensive and also not always possible. Um, so I think you've got kind of got two options. You can like localize the damage. You can say, right, I'm gonna preserve the grass on the rest of the, the farm area, localize the damage here and perhaps feed them in this spot. Or I can 
um, graze them and move them more frequently. And it sounds a bit counterintuitive because it might mean that your sort of daily stocking density might increase because you might need to break paddocks down more, but moving them on a sort of daily basis um, can reduce the, the damage um, by giving the, the grass more of a, the area more of a rest period, more time to recover. Um, and giving you more control over it. Um, so when I first got into this this role, um, I was actually working with farmers in England. Um, so when I first got into rotational grazing, I was working with farmers in England and one farmer in Wales. And it was during the wet weather in uh, 2012, 2013. And this one Welsh farmer on a new reseed was actually moving them every 12 hours. So you're actually moving them more frequently can reduce the poaching damage. It sounds a bit counterintuitive, um, but moving them more frequently just does help. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Mike, the, there was, I have to say, when you put up the, the, the graph with four different worms and the time of year that they're hitting, I had that horrible feeling that, oh God, we're doomed. Um, <laughs> And there was um, a question came in just just following that that was obviously um, looking at the graph thinking, oh, crikey. Um, and with so many species of worms being looking to be prevalent at the same kind of time, um, even when people are using really good management strategies, like some of the ones that you've highlighted there, are our anthelmintics that are currently on the market suffice? Or is there a kind of development piece to be done? Yeah, I mean, we obviously we, we had you know, three classes of anthelmintics for a very, very long time, and then and then two in, in relatively short succession. But unfortunately, you know, the it was you know for every new class that's been developed, resistance has developed more more quickly. Um, so although I think you know new anthelmintics would absolutely be welcome, um, I think we have to have to you know take a bit of a you know a more holistic approach. Uh, and I think probably that some of the research things that are coming down the line, hopefully, are are towards um, towards vaccines and and towards um, um, so sort of vaccines against some of the roundworms or potentially multiple roundworms. And um, there's been a lot of investment in trying to find. And then also, um, as uh, Graham's helpfully uh, put in in a, in a subsequent question about uh, you know, selecting for for stock as well, uh, I think you know, you know it does play a, a really uh, important role. Yeah, um, so, so Graham has put in a, a question that's, that's quite similar but with a different slant and that um, selecting genetics, would that be the holy grail of resilience? And um, quite quite nicely next week's webinar is actually going to have Joe Connington and Daniel Stout and we're going to be looking at genetics. So we'll maybe cover off some of, some yeah. of that stuff next week and I have put the link into the chat so if you've not registered then, yeah. then um, you may want to register for that one. Uh, the other question that's... that's... Oh, can, I, can, I, can I dive in and, and add a little bit? I'll, I, will, I will definitely tune in for that next week to see to see what they, they have to say as well. But um, I think there's a, that a lot of these things that we're talking about monitoring you know, can go hand in hand with selection, um, particularly when we're thinking about live weight gains. Um, although when we think about resistance, you know, there's lots of uh, you know, genetic tests or, or, or blood tests and things that we can do. But at the end of the day, if you're uh, particularly if you're a, a, a maternal uh, closed flock, selecting animals that are doing well in in the challenges that they face is, is always going to be going to be a good thing. And if that's including those parasite challenges, the the main caveat is that there's always been a, a a slight concern that if you do that, potentially the the challenge will change. Um, if 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 egg counts and things change, but there's I think less evidence for that and. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it next week. Great. Um, and just the final question, so I, I do realise the time. The final question for you was when you were speaking about targeted selective treatment, there's somebody who's questioned what would the benchmark be or what what daily life weight gain difference um, would you like to see as your threshold for dozing? I think, yeah, uh, it's a great question. I think it's very context uh, dependent. Uh, it's going to vary massively between... Um, between breeds and, and between uh, nutrition as well, but uh, a figure that's often talked about in in lowland systems is that two hundred grams grams per day. So as Poppy was shown on her her graphs, if you if you're really nailing the nutrition and and you, you're getting things you're managing things well from that perspective, that should be your very 
you know, very achievable. Uh, so if you're not hitting that target, uh, then you have to ask why and, and could parasites be playing a role in that? But you know, appreciating other systems, um, yeah, then you know, potentially a lower target might be more appropriate. And it's it's the whole it's the whole package, isn't it? It's it's nutrition management and health. So it's it's identifying as well, using resources like your faecal egg counts to make sure that, that it is that and you're not just drenching because the, the live weight's down, that it's not trace elements or, or something else outstanding. Poppy, have you anything to add with that one? Yeah, I often think um maybe it's an oversimplification, but this is when lambs aren't performing I think um, pasture is my first point of call. Have they got enough? Is it good quality? Then it's investigation or perhaps alongside it, investigation into parasites. And then that's when I'd start to look at if those two sort of areas are OK. That's when I start to look at things like trace elements. And often that's cobalt. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much, both Poppy and Mike. Two fantastic, fantastic um, presentations there tonight with so much information. Um, anybody that has missed any of the information or didn't quite catch it, we have recorded this evening and we will be putting it onto our YouTube and I'll circulate the link around everybody. So um, I, I can do that in the next couple of days so you can listen back. Um, and as I say, next week's webinar will be um, focusing on the labour side. So we'll have a different slant there with Joe and Daniel next week. Uh, thank you again to Mike and Poppy and to our funders, University Innovation Fund. And um, good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.